All right. Welcome everyone to the Gender, Media, and Combat Sports panel. I am very excited that under these difficult circumstances, we have gathered an amazing group of women together for a virtual panel on gender, media, and combat sports. I am Nancy Kidder of American University and in Washington, DC, where I've been teaching my writing and fighting class online for the past two months. I am very honored to be joined by my co-chair, Julie Kedzie of the University of Iowa. There's no other way to say it. You are a hero of mine, a true pioneer who fought in the early days of MMA all the way up to the USC and then got her MFA from the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm going to turn it over to Julie in a minute, but I just want to say that I grew up a boxing fan in Columbus, Ohio, home of Buster Douglas. And I remember, I think it was my freshman year in college back in uh, April of 96, when a boxer, Christy Martin, was on the cover of Sports Illustrated with the headline, the lady is a champ. From my perspective, it seems that women in sports have had moments at different times, but these moments often fade and get lost. Something about this moment and women in MMA feels different to me, never more so than looking at this talented, knowledgeable group of ladies about to talk fights. With that, I'm gonna introduce the panel ending with our co-chair and MMA OG, Julie Kesby. So we are joined by Laura Sanko, a former MMA fighter who was broken into the media side of the game through Invicta FC, the UFC's former partner, Fox, and now ESPN. I can hope we can ask Laura more about her plans um, on possibly becoming the first female commentator in the US for the UFC. We have Fernanda Prachis, uh, an MMA staff writer at The Athletic. She's a sports journalist based out in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, who has worked as a correspondent and reporter for MMA Junkie for three years. She also, I'm gonna put this on gallery, uh, served as a TV producer for channels 4TV and Combate for two years, focusing exclusively on fight-related content and began covering MMA in 2009. We have Melissa Segura, I believe is Melissa here. Um, if she comes, she is an investigative reporter with BuzzFeed, um, focusing on intersection of justice, class, and race. Uh, in the 2018 series, she uh, earned her the George Polk Award in journalism. And before BuzzFeed, Segura was a staff writer for Sports Illustrated. We also have Anna uh, Issa, a seasoned reporter with a long history in sports media. Uh, Anna is the first commentator for, on Canal, uh, the only female commentator on Canal Combate TV Globo, and analyzes fights as a color commentator for Invicta and UFC in Brazil. We have Evelyn Rodriguez. Um, she is TV Globo's West Coast correspondent. Based out of Las Vegas, she covers combat sports in the U.S. since February 2011, reporting live from backstage during the events. She has reported on some of the biggest sporting events of the past, including um, Gregor, Silva, uh, Ronda Rousey. Evelyn has also worked as a producer and casting director for several Brazi Brazilian TV shows on combat sports. We also have Tanisha Singleton. Dr. Singleton is an experienced media and marketing professional committed to reinforcing story, culture, and conversation back in business. In 2017, Tanisha earned a PhD in media psychology, specializing in fandom and digital disruption in sports. With a decade of experience in blending in traditional entertainment, Tanisha has turned her attention to tackling her passion in sports, aiming to support athletes. And finally, my co-chair, Julie Kedzie. Julie Kedzie made history when she fought Gina Carano in the first televised female MMA fight on February 10, 2007. A highly successful USC fighter, Julie is the color commentator for the Invicta Fight Championships. A graduate of the University of Indiana with a degree in English, Julie recently received her Master in Fine Arts and Creative Writing at the esteemed Iowa's Writing Workshop, where she is also a professor of writing. Julie is currently finishing her first book. Or is it finished? I don't know. We'll, we will see. <laughs> Uh, so with that, Julie, can I ask you, let's just dig in here because we're going to be focusing on women in MMA and also women in MMA media. Mm -hmm. So while there have been moments when women have entered the pugilistic world, including women boxers in the mid 1700s, as I said, Christy Martin in the 1990s and Layla Ali in the 2000s, many have viewed combat sports as a male dominated space until mixed martial arts. How did female MMA fighters transcend this space? Well, 
it's interesting um, to, I guess, say that just uh, female MMA fighters like were the ones to transcend the space and it, it didn't take a lot of time because it certainly took a lot of time. You know, in thinking about uh, this panel, I actually was going back through old articles about female MMA fighters and some of the deep dives into the forums, uh, which are, don't do that to your mental health. But, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of threads were, oh, hottest female fighter here and she's gonna get this fight and she's gonna get that fight. And so, you know, but I just, I can remember particularly media-wise something that stuck out to me. And it just, it kind of blew my mind that anybody would talk about fighters this way, but they got away with it, I think, because they were female fighters. And this is an uh, MMA fight. And it was between, it was in 2005, and it was a fight between Misty Blackwood and Michelle Farrow. And I'm just going to try, I have to pull this over. I don't know if this is blocking my screen or your screen or anything, but I just wanted to get the quote kind of right. Um, with Farrow, a startlingly muscular 37-year-old woman who looks uncannily like Robin Williams, if he played Mrs. Doubtfire as a buffed out rippling roller derby queen, perched over the blonde pigtailed Blackwood, affecting a Rebecca of Sunnybrook, Sunnybrook Farms innocence, although the two are approximately equal in weight. The quick 16-second battle is a perfect mix of world wrestling entertainment, soap opera, mixed martial arts mastery, and good old-fashioned mud wrestling titillation. That was in, I believe, 2005. And I'm just, that's actually, I guess, maybe that's long ago for some of you. That's not that long ago for me. That was around the time I made my debut. So entering this landscape and seeing the changes in this landscape, I don't think that this was an overnight thing. I think female MMA fighters have not necessarily transcended what other female athletes have had to go through. I think they've worked their asses off for it. Um, but I, I do also think that something different has happened. And I'd love to throw it out there to everybody else. Besides the working their asses off, and excuse my language, I used to fight and <laughs> it never leaves. Um, but, you know, beyond that kind of the hard work that's gone into it, I, I'm just wondering what people on this panel actually think it took or what went, I guess, what went differently for female MMA fighters than for female boxers? That's a good question. And Melissa. Hello. Hi. Maybe I'm gonna present that question to you then. Uh, but just to introduce you. Yes, well that's what <laughs> we need to come in. Um, but first of all, I just wanna say we are honored to have you here. You know, your work um, with uh, the intersection of justice, class, and race. Um, you know, as a fellow, you, you worked on a book detailing major fault lines with the criminal justice system, um, mm -hmm. which led to the exoneration of nine men who spent decades behind bars. Wow. Um, you know, you board, run the George Polk Award um, and a staff writer, and your career also uh, includes being um, a staff writer for Sports Illustrated. Yes. Uh, what yes. Does it take? The biggest accomplishment, though, that you didn't mention is when I lived in New York, I used to take Phoenix's um, classes all the time. And I saw that. <laughs> so I think um, for this panel, it might be appropriate to mention that. So thanks, Phoenix, for always kicking my butt back in the day. I could sure use it. Um, in terms of the difference between boxers and MMA fighters, um, that's a really good question. And I'm thinking in terms of some of what we've seen, I think we've seen a difference. It's, and I know, okay, so I've been out of the fight game for a while now, but um, what I do see and what I thought was absolutely transcendent, and please don't kill me for saying this, um, but I think having a character like a Ronda Rousey, like Gina Carano before then, having somebody who was so magnetic, um, so transcendent, um, helped to establish a storyline. Whereas um, the fighting sort of backstories of maybe um, Ali just didn't seem to stick as well um, in terms of like a media spectacle. I don't know. Um, I'll, 
it's just an idea um, that those particular characters at this particular time, and remember, like, the emergence of the MMA fighter was happening, right? I mean, I don't think it's probably a coincidence that we're starting to see this assertion of women, you know, as it precedes the Me Too movement, right? I mean, there were a lot of things, I think, probably culturally um, that maybe made um, us perhaps a little bit more willing as an audience um, to, to be ready to see women um, like divert from such cultural norms. I don't know, it's an idea. I'd be curious to hear what other people have to say. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I would like to put this out here. I think that, yes, did we have those monadic characters. Was it this uh, feminist uh, movement that was also interplaying? Was it also something about, and I'd like to ask the people who were in the gyms, like Julie um, and Laura, those early days, was there something about this was a younger sport and it didn't already have this kind of uh, masculine space already attached to it? Um, along with the fact that you were training with the men and then finally also in the same tournaments and matches, um, having, you know, the same amount of time, there's no difference, unlike other kinds of sports. Exactly. Someone please, uh, Laura, what do you think? Or, or Julie? Yeah, I think, sorry, I didn't mean to cut no? you. Julie, if you want to intercede here, you're, you're welcome to. I, I, I do think that has a big a big part to do with it. The fact that you're, you're not uh, segregated into completely separate leagues between the men and the women. They fight often on the same cards, but I, I like to think of it more as a, it's a groundswell. Like what Julie described uh, back in 2005, um, it's been this, this groundswell of, you know, back in the day, I remember when I was, when I would be put on cards as an amateur, it was sort of like as this freak show thing not like in terms of they viewed me as a freak show or my opponent as a freak show but it was like oh isn't this interesting women fighting oh let's look at that you know it wasn't like oh she's a good athlete they're gonna put on uh, as technical performance as the guys are but then it's sort of like so the freak show aspect of it opened the door just enough to have a few women's fights on a few cards and that continued to grow but the freak show aspect of it allowed people fans who are already fans of the male side of the sport and I do I do think it has been a I, I will say it is a masculine I mean it is a masculine sport from the beginning and in, in, in some ways still very very much is so the people who were then exposed to it kind of had might have had some of those moments where they oh wow that really that was better than I expected. That was less like mud wrestling than I expected it would be. And then over time, as people started to grow, and then I will say, I do, I think it's the platform of uh, companies like Strike Force and then ultimately like the UFC. You have to get these dominant female athletes in front of enough eyeballs for people's eyes to be opened. And the fact that Rhonda was, as you say, uh, magnetic. Uh, but dominant, you know, she dominant. won. She won and she won in emphatic fashion. There wasn't a, oh, that was a close fight. Oh, there was a lot of decisions, that type of thing. She had everything that you would need uh, to kind of make that breakthrough moment. But as we all recognize, there were people like Julie and like Gina and like Megumi Fuji and like the list goes on and on and on and on and on that created that platform for Rhonda to finally stand on and then for the UFC to be able to broadcast out to millions of people. And I think that Rhonda like happened, I call her a perfect storm because I, I do agree that uh, her figure was very important because she combined a lot of factors that appeal to a, a mainstream audience, but she wouldn't have, like, if it wasn't for the foundation that had been set before her and the historical moment, which I think was one of just sort of feminist awakening, it all really came together for that, uh, so that Rhonda, who I do agree is uh, such a, an instrumental figure in making women's MMA be taken seriously by the mainstream, um, I think just, the, 
the fact that she existed when she existed and the circumstances that she existed really helped. Uh, and I also think that having the same amount, like uh, Nancy was saying, just having the same amount of rounds, the same conditions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I also find interesting, I was doing a podcast the other day and the host posed that to me and I started sort of thinking about it because uh, in boxing with women, there was sort of the, there is the idea that there aren't as many knockouts and that, you know, this theoretically would be a problem for the casual viewer. And then you have Ronda finishing people in a different way. And in MMA, you have the grappling aspect, which, which mm -hmm. is different. I also think that uh, people are still sensitive to seeing women get hurt. A lot of people still are. They won't say it as loudly. They won't say it as overtly as they did to probably tell Julie 10 years ago, but they, a lot of people still feel that way. They don't think women should be hurt. And in boxing, you just have that option. And with MMA, like, especially with Ron and the way she finished fights, people didn't get bloodied up and bruised. So I also think, and this is just a theory, like we're all theorizing, but I do think that that might have played a factor at that time of having her at that time, but just because um, it helped people ease into it in a way, you know? Um, and I also think that having women fight in the same big cards really helped because it didn't create a difference. Like in leagues, you have women's sports, you have women's basketball and men's basketball. Like there was always that separation. Even though we still had that, you have one or two women's fights in a full card. Um, just having them in the middle there, in the main card, then in the main event, I think that also really helped um, in a way, I don't, I don't know at the core how equal it is, but I do feel like there is an impression that MMA might be have less of a gap than other sports. And I do feel like all of those factors, again, just speculating might have played into it. I think that perfect uh, storm analogy that you said was is perfect because she did seem to have all of those different spices in the recipe and with the timing and the performance and the execution and all. And I think too organizationally, once you value something, that will inspire your behavior, right? So if you mm -hmm. value inclusion, you will make sure then that women will be integrated naturally and not separated, like you said, in other sports so much where, it's you, where there's different rules and, and, and different features. WNBA, smaller balls, smaller core. I played basketball in college, but I grew up a, in a giant boxing fan and pro wrestling fan. And that gets back a little bit too, even with the Rhonda sensation, because she had that personality. She adopted Roddy Piper's rowdy mentality, you know, and she was in, and I think that story performance, that really speaks to, I think, how athletes can become their own brand, their own entity, and then pushing themselves, as opposed to probably even larger boxing organizations where you have a promotion that is promoting that brand as opposed to the individual athletes. Like we just, I, I'd hate to, you know, bring in other things, but even just as an example, it's like finally now the name, image, and likeness of college athletes is going to be recognized, right? So looking, bringing that back into this conversation, now you see that the athlete has the power. And once you start to, I think, get a little bit of that awareness, you can start to see that women have been here we've been in the gym rolling you know what i mean and so once you once you recognize that what you value will shape the behaviors that you make from an organizational standpoint then you can start to get more promotions more leagues and more managers to 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 integrate more and be a little bit more equal and and actually preach diversity and inclusion instead of just having it be window dressing you know what i mean mm -hmm. and, and i also want to i'm sorry because there's a, a, a historical thing here in Brazil. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there was a law here um, in middle of like 1950 that didn't allow women to compete in sports, really? in a combat sports. Yeah, it was wow. a law. So you couldn't compete uh, in, in, they say something like, in sports, they're not compatible with the women nature. <laughs> so by law, wow. women couldn't compete here in Brazil. And if you think that the, the MMA, it's something that um, in the beginning was uh, the Vale Tudo, that it all started here in Brazil. And you didn't, you didn't even saw like women on the Gracie family competing because they couldn't. Even in their family, they could. They were not allowed to compete or to practice. They, they could mm -hmm. even practice, but not compete. You know what I mean? So if you saw this, uh, the, the story when they break this, there was like two uh, judokas, two girls that practice judo, and then they have like a South American competition. 
and then they put her names as guys and because for the the the, the confederation to give them tickets to go they went there they won and they won for the first time like in the whole competition when brazil won for the first time because there were like women competing and then they like tell, they told the whole story to the the, the 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 confederation and then things started changing and i'm not talking about like a hundred years ago i'm talking about maybe 50 years ago so even i don't know and julie and laura they can tell it better but i remember when i started coping and, and training the more there was really it was really difficult for a girl uh, to find even an opponent you know when when opponent got hurt it would be like a drama because it was it, it wasn't like today so when you have like the ronda rousey thing exploding and then you incentivate like people are training more at the gym people see ronda they want to they want to be ronda as like a fan and then you start training and then you start having more girls and blah 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 and then then it goes so that was a reality in Brazil here, the country that started everything. That I think it's really important when you when you see this, why the sport uh, like 10 or 20 years ago wouldn't go this big because women wouldn't be allowed to compete. I think it's important too to, to recognize that when we see these Mount Rushmore moments and these, these benchmarks and culture that they often aren't the first right they're just the first to get recognized and then they have kind of revealed that there is an entire path of trailblazers behind them but given time resources exposure and all these perfect storm pieces falling into place they've reaped the benefits of not to say they haven't worked hard of course they certainly have to maintain that but it's they're never really the maybe they're the first in something but that they've been they've been privy to a lot of bone, sweat, blood, and tears of others. You know, there's never really, it's like in movies, like Halle Berry being the first black woman to win an Oscar. It's like, okay, but is she the best? Like, there's a hell of a lot of others that have been in great positions, you know what I mean? But we'll look at her as, as the first, which is great and, and of course recognized, but there, it, it shines light to, to the others that have paved the way, kind of similar. Exactly. So I'd, I'd love Julie, can you, I want your response to all of this because <laughs> we're talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there were way more before me, but, yeah. um, but you know, I, I guess <sighs> there's so much to respond to. And I just, I have a dozen questions emanating from this. One of the things that I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, people paved the way for me. There was generations of fighters before me. There were female fighters in America fighting in 1995. Um, without weight classes, you know, working their asses off, trying very hard to find fights. In the early days when I was trying to find fights, a lot of it was on actually the MMA forums, you know, just looking, asking, trying to do the, you know, put the work in myself, seeing who's out there and who's available. And other female fighters made like, you know, Debbie Purcell made forums available for women to connect. But I do have a question actually about visibility and about the perfect storm of Ronda Rousey. And this, her talent is, I mean, you can't argue with her talent and her charisma and, and what she was able to bring to the table. But I do wonder if the fact that she was blonde and white had anything to do with the fact that she got this much attention and this much push and the fact that it was happening in America. Because in other countries, um, I know that there was the, the law, well, I just learned about the law in the in 1950s in, in Brazil, but in Japan, female, I mean, they were all female fight cards. Um, female MMA fighters and kind of the intersection between Japanese female fighters and pro wrestling was very big. And it was it was largely accepted in a lot of that niche world that MMA is. But it wasn't in America. And all of a sudden, when it was in America, it Gina Carano um, really did so much for everyone. She wasn't blonde, but she was white. Um, Ronda Rousey, blonde white lady that all of a sudden Dana White decided is gonna be the face, he's gonna be the one who's bringing all that. Is it the American media focus that made everything, I guess, made MMA this ubiquitous, huge like thing, or was it, who she was, how she looked. Like, I, I just want to know people's thoughts on that. 
I think absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. When I say perfect storm, I mean multiple factors. And that was definitely one of them. I always say it's, it's not something that we like to confront, but it's the reality. And it still is to this day that being a good looking, uh, conventionally speaking woman, and uh, like you said, being white, it, it all really helps. I think that way that the wrong, like her blonde hair, her smile, her appearance, of course, he made her so palatable to the mainstream audience. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why. And I think uh, Rhonda was subversive in a few ways uh, just by having the personality that she had. If you look at Tough, for instance, she left Tough wildly unpopular, right? In comparison to Misha Tate, uh, because she had an attitude. She cried. She was a terrible loser. She, you know, she behaved in ways that I feel like women aren't um, allowed to behave in public spaces normally, right? You expect some kind of, um, you expect us to be nice and agreeable and smile a lot. And Rhonda to me was subversive in a way, but I think she was only allowed to be subversive in that way, had a lot to do with the way that she looked. Because if she wasn't white, for instance, and that, because that's another thing that it's a privilege that I have, that I have to acknowledge. My tone isn't as polished, you know, if I, if I went white, that would be an, a whole other thing. So I totally think, I have no doubt in my mind that the way that she looked, and that's not a knock on a detriment to her. What was she to do? Oh no, I'm too pretty. So maybe I should just step aside and not have all this success happen to me. It's unfortunate that the, that's the way that the system is built. And that's why I, I think it's important that we point this out. So it's like, are you treating this person differently because she looks a, a certain way that agrees more with you? And why does this way that she looks agree more with you? And then we can go a whole, about a whole thing about the U.S. and the way that, you know, things are built and that's a whole other discussion but to short answer to your question i have yeah that's not even up for debate to me like for sure the way she looked played a big role in how big she got i'll also jump in though and say that a lot of it also i mean yes we'll we'll all concede that fact that her appearance um was part of it it was a big part of it but the other thing that she had was story right yeah, she sure. had this amazing story and I think that um, any time that you have a figure like that, who's had you know such a journey, and I think that that's just as a storyteller part of me is why I loved you know covering fighting in general. It's because it is you know perfectly it follows the structure of what we all you know lay out in terms of narrative. The you know the whole premise of fighting follows like that exact narrative structure that so many of us want. And not only did Rhonda have that in terms of her opponents, she had that built into her entire life story um, in a way that was highly relatable um, and also extreme all at the same time. Um, and so I think that her, I, I, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue the fact that, um, that her appearance was part of it. Um, but I do want to add in that her story was remarkable. Um, and, you know, her mom, um, also that voice that she has, she's so pithy with those quotes. And, you know, it's the same way that we see athletes in the NFL was, you know, uh, Chad Ochocinco necessarily, you know, one of the best football players, no, but was he super charismatic and drew the attention of the media because of that? Do people, um, you know, whether I covered baseball or whatever, we a lot of times went to the person with the best quote, right? And that's just a function of, I think, like the workspace, um, and and the mediums in which we work we want people who speak well and she definitely had a mouth on her it's, uh, the it's, only it's, doubt that i get is that why cyborg wasn't the one chosen because she was so she was as, as destructive as Rhonda, for example she had an attitude she had a, a whole attitude but she wasn't the, the, the chosen one. so i think the, the the part of like being a superstar having car characters of being a superstar. And also the, the, the um, because I know the Americans are really proud of their athletes. So also being an uh, Olympic. Olympic medalist. Yeah, I think it, it plays the perfect storm as Fernanda said. And like not to just to, to say, but like 
the first fight that the UFC ever, like the, the, the first time that she had a rivalry too was with Misha, which kind of like brought the whole storyline and like, you know, the rivalry. Because her first fight was against somebody that they didn't even have time to build really uh, a rivalry in the UFC at least, you know, everything started with she trying to get the belt from Misha Tate in Strike Force, and then once she got to the UFC as a champion already, then they built again the timeline, like the rivalry with Misha. So that was also like another pretty girl, you know, that was the champion before, and then they had like the perfect story to start the to start that rivalry, and then went to tough and everything. So I think that was the point because. If you remember, like, I think in 2009 when Gina Carano fought Cyborg, the way that Cyborg destroyed Gina also was something that in Brazil, we were used to see Cyborg fighting. So everybody was very proud of it. But I think the rest of the world was a little shocked, you know, and the fact that you had like a girl that was so strong and powerful that could destroy somebody and somebody's career was something that I don't know how they would, you know, work with that going forward. Like we have... A lot of times you see people comparing Cyborg as guys, you know, the way she punches and it's not really a compliment the way they talk about her. So it's kind of a different way of introducing that product, you know, to to different people to, to see, oh, the way that more people can watch this and buy this as a product is we need somebody that is more marketable and easier. And that was, I think, all the story of Cyborg as well, going to the UFC. There was a point that they had to, to get her in because she was too good and she was like doing a lot, but um, she never really got the treatment that she actually deserved. And is that marketability, do you think it's related to, I mean, we've already talked about Americans uh, being proud of their athletes. So is that marketability due to kind of an American, uh, or maybe it's just the UFC or the Zoo, formerly Zufa. I, I'm still in the old school talk. Um, um, control of kind of how MMA is presented to the world, that it was important to have an American champion or an American female figure. We are like that too in Brazil. Like, you know, there was a time that we had like most of the belts in the UFC and the sport was growing and growing in Brazil. And like everybody was supporting MMA because we wanted to see Brazilian champions. They bring UFC in Brazil to see Brazilians beating up other nationalities, you know? Uh, that was how, that, that is how they actually start doing the UFC in Brazil again, you know, recently. So I think it's something that is, it is part of the culture in the whole world. Like everybody wants to see their own athletes succeed doesn't mean like oh if you have somebody that is in a different you know uh nationality and is very good you won't get attention like you see Joanna and Jack, for example you know she got here she's so good that everybody really kind of start watching her and seeing oh this girl is different but I think the path was already made for that to be able to happen in the past when MMA started in the in the UFC I think there was no really ground. They needed to start with something that people would look and say, oh my God, two girls that are pretty and white and know how mm -hmm. to fight and finish. Because that's the thing too. Cyborg would bring blood and she would destroy completely the opponent. That was something that they might not be able to show in a first fight in the UFC. And people would look and say, oh, this is nice. You know, there's still that factor that Fernanda said, like girls don't want to some people don't like to see women getting hurt. And that was something that in a cyborg fight, you know somebody's gonna get hurt. You know? I love, I, I like the fact that I think cyborg really paved the way for fighters like Amanda Nunes now to have massive popularity. And I think Amanda, I love the fact, you know, not only is she a Brazilian female fighter who is dominating and, and, and knocking women out, but she's also openly gay. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation that I think you can have positively about the sport uh, of MMA and what it has allowed for, um, for gay fighters to be open about their sexuality with zero problem, zero shame attached to it as it should be. So I think, I you know, a, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Man. female gay fighters. Yes. I agree. I, I was going to go that direction too, because. <laughs> And, and again, we could do an entire, we could do an entire panel <laughs> on that fascinating dichotomy, right? Like, oh, it's totally okay for these, you know, gay women to be totally open with their homosexuality and they're married, they're having kids, but 
oh my God, let's not ever fathom that a male, a, a, a gay male could be also an amazing fighter. Who knows? There might actually be someone in that situation that, anyway, again, <laughs> that's a whole other three hour long panel, but I, do, I it, it is a small, it's a small victory that I like. And I do think that Chris Cyborg um, did an amazing job of paving the way for someone like an Amanda Nunes. And in some ways, um, it is a little bit like, I don't know that sad's the right word. I'm not, I'm not coming up with the right word here, but it does feel like, like Chris never entirely got, uh, her, her due. I feel like she got it with the fans and you guys can certainly speak to, um, the figure that she is down in Brazil, but never quite clicked with the U S mainstream media. And we can, you know, the reasons for that I'm sure are, are varied and very complicated, but I do think that she, did an amazing job of paving the way for someone like Amanda Nunes to come in and, and, and be the GOAT. I was going to say that I think that the piggybacking a little bit off of um, what Evelyn said, that there is, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having that national pride, you know, like we're, that's why we have Olympics, like that, this is why we do these things. Um, and so each nation individually will kind of have their own ploy on how to market that. And that's where I think some of the um, issues will come about, like how Rhonda might have been not chosen, but why that perfect storm just met, or, or met rather. Because when you get talent and appearance and story uh, that are of equal weight and equal value, that's when you have this, this, this perfect recipe and I think so with the U.S. in terms of like marketability and cultural and stuff it's it's interesting because I think that's how a lot of people will get a layman casual fan will become a little bit invested you know and even like for example my brother who's not who doesn't know much about this he's more kind of like a boxing guy but me as a big fan and I'll go to his house and I'll throw on the fight and we'll watch and he was like well, how come there are no black girls? Like, where's Keisha? Like, what, how, where, what, how, why is it, you know what I mean? And so it's like the first thing I thought, you know, like in this quarantine, like I took out my afro, I was like, oh shit, I'm like a light heavyweight Angela Hill. This is awesome. Like, <laughs> it was the first thing I thought, you know? <laughs> and, but, and so to even, you know, for her, that's the first line in her bio. First African-American UFC fighter, female fighter, you know? And so, it goes back again to what I kind of said earlier about like what you value and how that translates into inclusive behavior. It's important to, to recognize that and each nation will kind of have its own different things. So for us in the United States, obviously we're not as far along as we claim to be in any category, gender, orientation, racial, cultural, economic, so on and so forth. So, and that's why it's becoming, I think it, why it's becoming a little bit, hard for I think professional MMA fighters to female ones anyway to to get that type of recognition because you're battling a hundred different things besides who's in the cage with you can I gosh you, I don't know does anyone have a hard stop at 1230 because I can see this going a little longer so just let me know um can we Julie and Laura you guys now um I this has been so interesting looking back at a perspective of how we got here. Uh, Julie, you're um, at Invicta um, doing the commentary and then, and Laura as well as also the Contender Series. What is the female fighter, the young female fighter? Is her outlook different? Um, I'm curious, um, knowing that they, you had to start in gyms where you were likely one of the only females. What is their perspective? I do think it's different now. Um, and Julie and I, are, are kind of an interesting dichotomy because she comes from and you know the generations in MMA are sort of short-lived so Julie comes from a different generation uh than I do she paved the way you know for for people in kind of my class I started training in 2007 and fighting in 2009 so um yeah I was I was the only girl for uh I couldn't even tell you how long but now it's unusual to go to a bigger, not any MMA gym, but a bigger MMA gym and, and not see females training. So that has, that has definitely changed. I see parents all the time coming up. I know they come up to you, Julie, all the time after Invicta fight and they're bringing their daughters to Invicta shows, uh, you know, to see an example of, of what a certain type of female athlete can, can be like. So I do see a massive change in the way that little girls are allowed to start jujitsu. They're allowed to start 
kickboxing and that that's amazing to see. I don't, uh, Julie, I'm sure you can share even more. Well, your outlook, of course, is um, much more positive than mine. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, I guess just because if we're talking generation, generationally, um, you know, being the only female MMA fighter in the gym, um, that meant you were subject to a lot of critiques. Um, yes. People were either too easy on you, too hard on you. Um, there was a lot of sexual assault. There was a lot of uh, inappropriateness that I don't know if it would fly right now, but actually, I actually don't know if it would fly right now. I know that the Me Too movement has done tremendous things for uh, speaking out, but I'm not necessarily sure that these issues have, um, when it comes to inappropriateness or treating women like equals in the gym, if these e issues have actually been resolved. I don't know if there's ever going to be resolved issues when it comes to treating uh genders uh people of different genders you know uh equally and so i um i don't know i i do love it when i see little girls come up and they talk and they say oh my gosh you know i saw this i saw you or i saw laura i saw this and and that it's a tremendous thing to be a factor in that visibility although i don't know that I was a huge factor, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but I, I think that it, it, it's wonderful and it's important. Um, but I do think that women in gyms are still at risk, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes. But I think teens nowadays, uh, in Brazil, we saw, we're seeing this happening more and more. Uh, as the MMA, as the female MMA, as the UFC got more weight classes and things like that, we started seeing like just female classes. Like they, they uh, actually in, in, the, in the past, they had to fight, like they had to train with men and there wasn't really like the right training because the, the guy would go like, oh, I can't, I'm not gonna go hard on her or maybe I, because I, I can hurt her. And no, now you have like, for example, at Nova Union here, um, Aldo's team, you have like Kathleen, Poliana, and 10 more girls training with them, you know, with themselves. So I think it's becoming more professional. And with more women watching, practicing, starting to compete, and you're getting more and more like a training camp, especially for exactly what you're going to face, you know? And it was different back in the days. I think what, uh, going back to what Julie said about just a heavier aspect of it, or just of sexual assault or harassment or things like that, um, agreed. I, I think it's still a problem. I'm not training at the gym, so I don't know, but you hear the reports. What I feel like that has been happening is uh, people are being forced to be more accountable, the gyms, because now if one thing like this, a report leaks, they're very quick to quick kick the person out. Um, I think a lot of that is performative, you know, because I think there's this a feeling um, that sometimes a lot of the people knew about certain things and they didn't speak up publicly on it. Um, and then the minute it becomes public, the person get, gets kicked out. There is, and uh, well, I'm talking MMA, but we see that in every single industry, right? Like these stories of powerful men and we have an, um, uh, Harvey Weinstein, the main, the became the proponent of the whole thing. But like, you have that situation of we know that there, wherever there is power and balance, that it's a, uh, an environment that is very like is a very harassment prone, you could say, environment. Um, so I think it's a reflection of the world, really, that now it can't fly publicly. Um, you have the thing that on the one hand, we don't, this is what we're seeing publicly, so we can't really know what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, but I do think it's good even if it's now um, a little performative even if it's now more like because a lot of people say oh they only did it because of public pressure okay but they did it so i'm a pessimist optimist in a way that you know like i i see that i think that there's a lot probably again speculating more than we're seeing but i like I'm a little optimistic in that sense that now people are being at least publicly held accountable in a way that i'm sure they weren't like 10 years ago um, on that, besides female fighters, the media circles are pretty much a boys club as well. How has that affected, I mean, I, I'm a color commentator, I'm not a reporter, I'm not a journalist, um, 
how has that affected any of you? Like, I, I don't want to ask you to reveal horrible experiences or anything, but, but it's a hard club to get into. And how, how has that been? And how have you um, navigated that? And can I just give some statistics? Do, just to, you know, I'm always about sourcing for my students. A 2019 report conducted by Women in Sport has revealed that 40% of women experience gender discrimination in the sports industry. Over 40% of the women felt that their gender can have a negative impact on the way in which they're valued by others at work, while 30% have experienced inappropriate behavior from someone of the opposite sex in comparison to 10th of men. Wow, these, these statistics are scary. And Julie, yes, continue on. What do you guys, is this the, the way it is, the, the old boys club? I, I have an interesting example personally, because my example of, uh, is Anna, because I worked uh, with Anna at Sport TV, where she's now a commentator for Combat. And like when I got in the business, Anna was already uh, a part of it and already uh, huge. Because like Anna will never say it, <laughs> she's humble, but she's uh, cle she's obviously one of the main uh, characters in MMA media in Brazil, if not the biggest. Period, um, and has been for a, re a really long time. And what I thought. Uh, looking at her uh, when I joined the channel was I felt like she had been unfairly held back for too many years. And to me, that was very clearly a gender thing. And when I say that, a lot of people think that we're saying that men are like, oh no, she's a woman. I will not let her through. And it's not as simple as that. Men being villains who just look at women and be like, no, you're a woman, so you're inferior. You have a system where you have men in high positions, you have men bosses, you have men company owners, you have men uh, catering to men. And they, I don't think there's an, even a concerted effort to hide it. In a product like the UFC, for instance, I think it's a very clear, uh, uh, it's very clear who they're, who they're speaking to and their TV product uh, anyway. But that's a whole other thing. But like uh, systemically, what you're going to get is if you have only men up here, they're the ones you're going to bring the men up there with them too. You have sort of like this self-fulfilling prophecy, this like cycle that repeats itself. And then, you know, when you're a reporter trying to get things like most of the managers are men. Uh, for a long time, this changed, but the men, at least in the mainstream positions, the vast uh, majority of fighters were men. So the boys club is not necessarily a conscious effort by men who got together in the big men summit and decided to be assholes, but just a system that is just feeding itself in a way that makes it very hard for a woman to break into. I witnessed uh, Anna break into that system by sheer force of hard work because she's always been a very uh, hard worker and a lot of passion for the sport in a way that I haven't seen in, in, in that many people. And uh, my impression looking out, looking in was just that, you know, like, I think that she should be much further along than she is. And she made it, then she became a correspondent. Now she's a commentator, like by all standards, she's a successful and extremely successful professional, but uh, looking out, it discouraged me in a way. A lot of people did the opposite. They were like, look at Anna. Like, you can be Anna. Like, don't be discouraged. And in my mind, I was like, look at how much shit Anna, sorry, had to do to get to where she is. So, you know, like, that was the, the tug of war in my mind. Like, man, okay, that's awesome that she did that. But at the same time, it's like, if it looked so unfair. Well, to me, and to me, it's a bittersweet feeling. I look at Anna now, and I'm like, this is amazing that this is such an accomplished professional. At the same time, I'm like, Five years ago, this all could have happened. Uh, maybe if she was a man, you know. Do you guys mind oh if my. I jump in here? Um, you know, I just think thank Fernanda <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know, as as far as terms of it being a boy club, and I think some of the pressures that females in the industry go through, which I I have always felt, and I feel that you guys probably feel as well, is you cannot mess up. Because if you mess up, you're a woman and it means that you didn't deserve to be there in the eyes of yep. some people. So I, my stats have to be perfect. I can't screw up because it, it, if it's like online, then you don't deserve to be there or how'd you get the job? Meanwhile, we all forget a stat here and there um, or mispronounce a name because there's a name like Yonjacek or Halavacek was one of the ones I had to deal with. 
so so god forbid you mess up you always felt that not only did you have to be as good as the boys you had to be better than the boys because you were going to be critiqued more than them and i think that's a, a pressure as a female you always feel and you always have to be on top of your game um, because of that the second thing is that it almost feels like the way people look at it, it is if you're like a superhero team and there's one chick there's never allowed to be more than one female on the broadcast. And that always bothered me. It's like, well, you're gonna pick this girl or that girl. Well, why can't there be multiple girls? Like, I'm not trying to get any other girl's job. I'm trying to get my own job and hopefully work with those women that I really respect. You know, how nice would it be to have two women in the booth? How nice would it be to, to have multiple girls on the team? I have always been in a position where I work with all guys. And honestly, it's kind of annoying. Because when I'm at dinner with all of them, I wish I just had a girl to turn to every once in a while after work. So I feel, I think those are two things that for me personally that I've dealt with, the, the, the pressure to always be on top of my game because I'm going to get criticized more than others. And then the second was, you know, I'm alone sometimes. And that like, if there's a job opportunity, it's, it's only going to go to that one chick. You can only have one chick at a time. Mm -hmm. And that like always you know, bothers me or when people you compare you to other women, like they don't, I don't see people comparing Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier. I just see them in their positions. Those are their jobs. And um, I don't know if, if anybody else wants to piggyback on that or has felt the same. <laughs> I, I think it's fascinating <laughs> to be talking about this right now because literally uh, last night, you know, or yesterday, I should say on Twitter and online and other places, you know, Julie can speak to this too. It's fascinating to see people's reaction when um, an article came up about me wanting to commentate one day. And it was just a question I was asked in an interview and I answered it honestly that, yeah, that is my goal. It's not like I was uh, asking for this article to be written. I didn't ask for the question to be asked either, but I answered it honestly. And then immediately what you just described, Phoenix, is exactly what happened. People start like uh, having to create this ranking system and like comparing so-and-so to so-and-so and almost like pitting trying to pit uh the the females in this industry uh, against one another and i i was sitting there cringing reading not only just the negative comments about me but there are a lot of great positive ones too but mostly the ones where people are trying to like well i think it should be so-and-so or i think it should be so-and-so and again to your point what couldn't it be both or all or any because exactly as you say you know people are not saying it has to be Joe Rogan or Daniel Cormier, Paul Felder or Dan Hardy. They're all awesome. And by the way, if if I or you or whoever ever gets to join that booth, I'm not trying to take one of their jobs either. You know, it's not a, uh, if she comes in, then one of these guys has to lose out type of situation. And it was fascinating to see people trying to pit Julie versus me versus you versus and I was just like this is insanity like I love these women I want us all to do well I, I just want to add one thing before I don't know if you and I will speak or not but like I I was not working I was working for her for over two years when she was a correspondent here in, in Vegas and I followed through like I saw everything that happened to her and how hard she worked to, to actually be able to put her face on TV because at the, at the beginning, they would just allow her to uh, go on TV by the phone. She was here. She had, oh, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the way we work, but like we are one girl team. Yeah. We do everything. So we are the cameras. We edit. We do live hits. We do everything. One person working backstage every day. Like if you see us on, on fights, fight nights, the way we are on tv like it's just us we are the only person there with the camera the microphones and everything and and i was be, was doing that for a long time before i came along and uh it was very hard for me to see that i remember when anderson silva got caught in the anti doping you know he was doing tough here in vegas and she couldn't was the first time that she actually put her face on tv because there was like they would send another reporter to, that was not familiar with the situation to put this reporter as a reporter and she was working to produce that reporter they would not let her in they would not let her go on tv to 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 do this to the story and she was the one working and doing all you know producing everything to that reporter that didn't even know what he was going to talk about to put his face on tv so it changed a lot 
And uh, once I came along and we worked for two years, now I am the TV correspondent because she opened the path for me, you know? She was the first female to do that. And after she went back to Brazil and start, you know, her show, her TV show and everything, they sent another reporter here. It was like, I worked with him for a while and now I am the correspondent because she opened the path. So it's, it, I know the first person usually is the one that do a lot more work and she, I'm glad that she did the work, not just because I'm here today, but because also she opened the door for a lot more people, a lot of, a lot of more women to came along. Today is just me and her and we have another producer in the in Combate, but because we are, you, I saw how hard she, how hard she was working, and today I can work and see like, well, she did that, she got where she wanted, so I think I can do as well, you know. And Anna's I want to thank cry. her. She's crying already. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank her really because I think that was like something that for me to be able to see it from here, how hard how hard she was working. And like how hard she actually, she was, she created the first MMA show in Brazil uh, and, you know, back in the days where they couldn't have MMA on TV. She would interview Anderson Silva talking about other sports just to put him on TV. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very hard to see, like, if you talk about MMA in Brazil, you have to see how hard this girl worked for everything to be where it is today. Wow, <laughs> Evelyn and Fernanda, you're going to kill me. And you know that I'm pretty emotional right now. Um, so there is one thing that I learned with my dad and my mom. It's that when you love something, you have to pull all the effort because nobody wins when you put an effort on it. And there was a lot of effort. Um, I think in Brazil, it, it goes, I think everything that we're talking about, it's not only a, a re, um, when, when you just say MMA, you have to see MMA and the culture, right? And everything that happens uh, in our country. So when I started covering MMA and when we had this like crazy idea about showing uh, how the athletes really were, not only just like cutting and hip hop because uh, back in the days, and we had like here in Brazil, a really, really bad image because of the Valitudos, the, 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 the Pete boys, like the guys that went to the streets just to fight. And so the, the image of the sport wasn't, wasn't really allowed in my TV. There was a TV that has the UFC rights, for example. So we couldn't talk about it. So we decided just like to make a change in the whole product, in the way that people could see what, the, uh, what MMA, what the sport was, was really about. And uh, back on the days in Fernanda and Evelyn, they know this as well. Um, Combat, you thought that it was a cool, it was like a sport made uh, for men to watch. So men are going to watch. So all the reporters, they have to be like supermodels. So they had like a lot of like 10, I don't know, five reporters that they were good, but they, they, they really didn't know. It was like what, what Evan was saying. Like sometimes they were like a producer that knew everything about it, but he didn't get the look. And I didn't got, I didn't had the look that they wanted at the time. So this is why they, sometimes I went, I, I, I wasn't able to go on air because I didn't get the look that they wanted, you know? And it was hard. I cried a lot. I cried we a have lot. the same. We shared a favorite bathroom to cry in. <laughs> yeah, Anna taught me about bath. the best yeah. bathroom to I, I cry in at yeah. the station. Yeah, yeah. You, you can go at the station and <laughs> cry in that bathroom. That was the one. Um, um, my my crew and um, Evelyn wasn't at that specific crew at the time, but all just guys were just yeah. So it's different. So sometimes when you have like, you have to. This is what I think uh, Laura said. Uh, uh, no, I don't remember who said that. But you sometimes you have to like, you, you want to connect, you want to talk about it. There's an idea that you have like someone who has your perspective to, to discuss with and you don't have because you just have guys working with you. Sometimes it's hard, you know, like to go out of the bubble. And it was hard, but it, it paid off. And I think a lot changed, but there's one thing that I discussed like two weeks ago and it's something that you still see, like Fernanda, she has like this English that it's wonderful. And you don't like translate, uh, we don't have more a translator like Derek. What, what Derek does, we don't have it. So we have to do it like the, the or the, the commentator or the, the 
how do you say the who, play who by the play. host the play by play right like Joe Rogan and and DC so they mm -hmm. had to translate okay for example they don't have someone translating for them the corners or the interviews and Fernanda had the the best English in the whole team and they we are like why she, why she can not, why she can do it we, 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 you know, it's going to be really weird uh, if a woman translates a man's voice. Or a guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do it. but the guy translates the what? I don't, I don't <laughs> get it. The Oscars, everything. What, is, what the fuck are you saying? You know, and they won't let her do it. Uh, that, 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 that's what happened. Just a voice because, and again, what I was saying about the product being made, I'm sorry to cut you off in it, but like the product, that's when it becomes clear that the product is catered for men because they're thinking that they might be put off by that voice and they wouldn't be put off by the opposite, right? But to me, like, uh, and I, not to make this a Brazilian thing, but like this is a testament to, there's this mythology that, uh, and this goes back to what Laura was saying in Phoenix about women always being pitted directly against each other right? There's this myth that women are catty, that they're competitive, that we're trying to take out each other. And this is, I think that the reason why this myth appears is because the system is trying to piss us, pit us against each other. People are trying to pit us against each other. Like Laura said, I posted, I tweeted that I thought Laura would be a fucking amazing, uh, again, sorry, bad word, an amazing commentator. And the comments were, oh, but uh, a lot of people agreed, which is great because obviously she's incredibly competent and would do an amazing job at it. I don't think anybody here would dispute that. But what a Julie, what about Lauren? But Laura, again, there's a whole team of men and they're fine with that. But the minute, like you'd mentioned, Laura, the the, not the first because the uh, original UFC event had a- Kathy Long, yeah. Yeah, Kathy Long. But like, we would have one and we're already talking about this and all the other comments like, oh, but uh, I don't know how many, years ago, uh, we put the, a woman to commentate the women's fights. That is part of the problem. You're limiting us to this tiny little space and saying, be glad. Look, we're letting you have this. Yes. And, you know, and just making this about being one of us against the other. And it's just a very hard atmosphere. And that's why I think it's really cool that we're doing this because it would be very easy for us to be uh, looking at each other as competition, a lot of us. And I don't feel that. I never felt that. I always felt a lot of support. Uh, Aveline and Anna, like, We've always sort of been the three of us in the same space in Brazil. And I never, ever wanted to compete against them. And they always supported me. And I think that's just, a, I just bring that up, not because we're really awesome. We are, but um, <laughs> beside the point, but just because I think that it really combats the narrative that women are naturally catty or they're fighting each other for the same things. I think it's like Phoenix said, and like Laura said, no, people are trying to do that to us. Mm -hmm. And I think now more than ever, we're like waking up to that and refusing to let ourselves fall into that trap. Excellent point. Um, I want to just um, make sure we also recognize, we talked about, you know, Ronda Rousey and her role and or what the women who paid this. Shannon Knapp, she has created a promotion, uh, a female run promotion. Now, is that structure, I'm so curious for the people who've worked with Invicta, does that have a different kind of climate? Any... Julie, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Well, uh, you've worked in both uh, extensively, so I think it's, it's probably going to be like more in, in your area. Um, I recognize, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but Jen and Nap, yeah. one of, like as one of these leaders, but go ahead, please. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the reasons Shannon Knapp founded Invicta is because of the way she was listening to some men at the top talk about female fighters and uh, wanted you know, that equal, equal playing ground, um, playing ground, maybe equal fighting ground. And so, you know, I mean, she really did revolutionize so much by, by creating Invicta, but I, I'll definitely let Laura, um, weigh in on what, you know, like the, the atmosphere differences there. Yeah. I mean, I, well, and first of all, definitely have to give props to Shannon out for, having the vision to start, listen, we all know starting any promotion, male, female, a mixture of both is fucking hard and really, really difficult to make it eight years. So happy anniversary to Invicta yesterday for um, being successful for eight years now. Um, 
Yeah, there's there's definitely there are definitely massive differences between uh, the two cultures. Um, I think I, I will admit that part of that has to do with the sheer size of the circus. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest difference. But there there are cultural differences. You know, Shannon Shannon has made Invicta from day one very much uh, a family atmosphere and um, promoted a lot of um, support for the individual fighters. What I what I have always and still am amazed about to this day, even to her own, even to the detriment of her own organization, Shannon allows fighters to be very open about the fact that they want to make it to the UFC because that in their mind is the top of the game. And let's be real, it is. Okay. Um, she she has never said you can't talk about, you know, the UFC in a post fight interview or something like that, which and she allows fighters to make that leap uh, when they're ready to do so. And that, that is, to me, the biggest sign of all that she is about the fighters and their careers and their lives, um, even when, to be honest with you, it causes her business uh, to struggle at times. So that, to me, is like the biggest cultural difference. But I will say... You know, it, it's so nice. <laughs> the Invicta broadcasts are nice. I love how I love hearing Julie's voice alongside TJ. I love the fact that again, wow, two women on one broadcast. What a thought! <laughs> uh, I love the fact that um, I don't know. I feel like the the stories of the fighters are very are extremely important. But in my experience with the UFC, you know, there, I think what uh, what Nanda was talking about, you. It's more of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't ever get the sense that like um, there is an anti-female contingent at all. I, I don't feel that way. I'll, in fact, I would actually say that um, the UFC is is very supportive of its female athletes. It's supportive of its female wor workers um, within the production side of things. I do think where the rubber kind of meets the road is this perception of what the audience wants but what the audience wants is what we feed it right or if we can't if we never feed it something else how do we know what it wants to begin with um but i don't i don't think there's necessarily a ingrained intentional you are female therefore you must be this but i do i do feel there's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy it's much it's much easier I, I have been i have been told from people i look like a reporter right and what does that mean i don't know what that means but i you know we maybe we can we can all guess what that means and it, it's it's tough i'm like well what i can't i can't change my face <laughs> i can't i i i don't really know i don't really know what that means and you know being told like you have to dress a certain way to be taken more seriously well, I like to dress how I like to dress and I'm going to say the same information, whether I'm wearing um, a, a potato sack or the shirt I'm wearing right now, why does it matter? So those are the things I definitely think are still, um, I'm still battling against. Other women are still battling against um, within this industry and not just the UFC. I can't speak to Bellator, but I can only imagine that this is not just unique to the UFC, but um, there are improvements that can be made. Um, and I think, I think that they will be made. I, I have a, I have a positive, uh, I am wishing positive thoughts. <laughs> I'm trying to bring positivity into existence. <laughs> oh, and I can just, um, Amy Kaplan had to leave, um, uh, but she left a message saying, um, that, you know, uh, being plus size is a hardship that the men in media don't feel as much as the woman, um, cause of this, Perfection is self-fulfilling. Um, do you guys feel that men have any kind of um, sense about their appearance? Um, and but, but but women do. I think the argument that people will make is always that oh you know it's TV appearance always matters the way you look it's always important uh, and then you talk about female oh but look rock cold. And what I point out is that the fact that you can point out to a single man or a, it's always like this, but this guy is good looking. This, and it, that misses the point entirely. The pressure on uh, women to look a certain way, it's 
it's so obvious to all of us who live it that whenever like I post something about it and I have like people disagree, I'm like, this is, this is not a controversial opinion. This is fact. This is reality. This is how we exist in the, in the world. And it takes a very blind person, like who's really not willing to have that empathy to negate that. And it can go both ways. Like Laura said, like you look, you, she, she looks a certain role and then, you know, or it, it, it's like a can't win situation because yeah, be attractive, see, just not too attractive. Yeah, exactly. Be, like be not menacingly. The right amount, whatever that is, we don't know. <laughs> and be humble about it. Like you can't <laughs> act like you know that you're conventionally good looking. Or and then you have the she only got there because she's pretty. So it's there's no way that you can't really escape it. Like you never look the right way, and then when you do look the right way, people are casting doubt on your accomplishments. Even when we were talking about Rhonda a while back. Uh, People reduce her to her looks. What I'm saying is her looks were a factor, but they wouldn't have mattered if it wasn't for everything else, right? So you always have that conversation that the way you look always matters. It always carries weight, inevitably. We know that because we know what we have to do when we wake up in the morning. We know what we have to do before we show up on camera. We know that we have to worry about how we're going to show up in that, in that business meeting. I was talking to fans the other day um, for a story that I'm working on about exactly being, uh, being a, a female fan of, of MMA. And a girl was talking about how she uh, was worried because she didn't, when she attended fights by herself, she wore like sweatshirts because she didn't want to draw too much attention to herself. And this, again, we're going out of media here, but just, it's a part of our lives. We're so used to it. We grow up in it. We live in it. And we know that it's the same with media. Of course, the way we look plays a factor. I can absolutely understand what Amy is saying. Like, um, yeah, you're going to point out, oh, but this, it's not, men also have self-esteem issues. Men also have face prejudice. Men are also dealing with, yes, they're all dealing with the same problems. We're not taken away from that. But I think it's just, it's not, I'm not seeing anything new or groundbreaking here when I say that, of course, it matters more what a woman looks like in terms of all the opportunities she gets as a professional, but particularly the opportunities she gets in front of a camera that, as we've established, is looking to cater to a male audience, maybe more, maybe less so now than it was a few years ago, but still very much that. Yeah, I was just going to add to that and say, it's like, you, you can't win for shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you really can't sometimes. It's, I mean, it's, it's something where you, you have to, I've at least gone through experiences where you have to shift, right? It's like, okay, well, do I, you know, if I put on the power suit, it's like, then I'm too intimidating. But if I, you know, look casual, it's like, well, now I look dumb or something, you know? And so it's, it's hard to play, it's hard to switch those roles. And then you add extra, like, um, extra, I don't know, personality and demographic features, you know, it's like, I'm 6'1", I'm 205, as you add intimidating, you talk sports, you have a PhD, as you just get this intimidating factor where it's like, okay, well, no, I don't want her in the booth, or I don't want her talking about stuff because she'll outshine me, or she'll outshine the guy or something, so at some point, like, I'm hopefully positive that there will be some of that, um, a little bit more inclusion and stuff, but it, it will take not only just hard work for, you know, for women like ourselves, but also an ally. Like, it takes a team and a community to be able to, like, check each other. Like, I am pro-checking people, you know? <laughs> and it's like, and if I see something wrong, I'm going to say something's wrong. And so when it takes others, I think, in this space to to have, I don't know, at least the the confidence and to, to do that, you know? Especially, like, when I've rolled in gyms before and, and I've, you know, sparred with, like, guys and girls and because of my size and and if somebody does something wrong we check each other i think that's why a team is so important in that regard and that can be in a booth on the mat uh you know or in a classroom but it, for the looks part of it it's like yeah that that yeah like you said Fernanda, this is not new it will never be yeah, i don't know how when this will ever get resolved i don't know if it ever will um and it's like yeah like not every guy looks like Idris Elba you know behind the booth but it's like unfortunately unfortunately <laughs> okay I'll objectify a little bit just let right. me have this continue sure but at least they have the talent though right they you love hearing them so that's why it we can't just assume that roles are going to be given to us and we can just lay back and be like well you need one to check that box you know and that's why every application asks for gender and all the other you know, extracurricular stuff that, that we have to go through. But it's like, you, the talent has to be there too. The hard work, you know, that Anna and everyone else on this has been putting through, like that has to meet an ally and and the, 
and just some willpower to, to say that this needs to change because there's a lot of talented people getting left out. Everyone deserves a seat at the table. I just want to add one thing. To... Oh, sorry. I don't know who else no, I just wanted to, to, um, to just mention that this also applies to the athletes themselves, right? In the UFC, we're not seeing higher weight classes. We're not seeing larger women competing as well who might also have that ability. That's all. Absolutely. I've always wanted that too. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, even we were t uh, to go boxing, you know, Clarissa Shields and Layla Lee, you know, been having this spat and, you know, she's walking around like, like, yeah, well, I'm 205 right now, but I can get down to 185 if that's where she wants to come up, you know, but mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's, it's always been interesting too. But like, okay, well, the talent, I guess, will have to drive that, right? Mm -hmm. Like is where, where will we see, when will we see, you know, middleweights, light heavy, whatever, like going, I don't know, getting that opportunity to, to have to have that shine. There has to be the talent and the fighters, which I'm sure they are there and they are working. But when will we accept that you can be strong and beautiful at 170 and be on TV and kicking an ass too? Why are we killing ourselves sweating and on you know to, to cut weight when you walk around nine months out of the year not at that weight like when but that's just a men's cultural mentality of what we think our ideals are in terms of beauty and performance and the roles that we have to play i, I was just gonna say like when i start covering mma here in america in 2000 uh 2010 you know 2011 uh, there was not a lot of women in this field. Uh, it was me, probably uh, Megan Olivi, Megan Olivi, and uh, Karen Bryant. We had like a few other women probably working behind the scenes, but like on camera was just those two that I remember over here. And then Anna came like also a little later to be the correspondent. And at the beginning as well, because I was Brazilian, my English was not good. And uh, you had accent, you know, sometimes it was kind of hard to start working in uh, a field that you, I was not from MMA before. So I had to, to start going to the gyms and figuring out what I was going to talk about and learning about the sport. And uh, I remember that at first because I got, um, you know, I was younger even. So people would just look at you and they would not respect you as a, a correspondent or as a journalist. So I had to develop like some, how to say, some ways of getting the information, you know, and also to uh, protect myself. And I remember that one of one of the things I started doing was trying to be friends or trying to go through the wives, you know. I would start be friends with the wives, so they would help me to have access to their husbands, and I would not have like that problem of somebody trying to hit on me or like trying to. So it was one of the ways that. At the beginning, I developed like the system for me. Okay, I'm gonna go to the wife and I'm gonna present myself so they will see that I'm not here. Uh, I'm just here to do my job, no, not to try to hit on her husband. Cause that was something that at that time, a lot of people would just look at you and say like, you know, uh, this girl is here, she's young, she doesn't speak English and whatever, what she's gonna talk like. And I remember my first time that I had to actually go to a room to interview a fighter and it's, Sometimes, like, if you are not a girl, you won't think about that, you know, like, how I'm going to go to this room to see this guy and interview him. So it was a lot of situations where I saw myself for the first time. So I kind of developed the system. I was just curious to see if you girls have any stories like that to share as well. I have one. <laughs> I mean, probably more than one, but I... I the the room thing is funny because uh it's very like um very common when you're with this traveling ufc circus and you're all in the same hotel and every fighter's in his in his room and if you need to go speak with that fighter and especially if it's if they're cutting weight you don't want to make them drag them down to the lobby you know i try to i try to get people to meet me in the lobby but they don't always want to do that and it is, it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting thing uh, because I, I remember one time I was coming out of, um, I think it was actually Marlon Marais's room and uh, someone else, like I was, I was leaving his room after, after meeting with him and talking with him and someone else was walking down the hall. I don't remember what fighter it was, but he kind of gave me a look like, a, and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is how it starts, right? This is how people start to think 
that Laura was in this room for maybe not, you know, reporting reasons, but it's, it's, it is fascinating how you, you're absolutely right. Maybe you have to think about, there's all these extra layers that you have to think about when you are, you know, a female interviewing uh, men in, in this sport. Um, I try not to let, I don't know, I try not to let it be too much of a factor until it comes to dealing with their family. Like if I ever sense that there is a, a wife or a significant other that might be uncomfortable with my presence or, or, or whatever, I definitely go out of my way to do that. But other than that, like the whole rumor mill thing, I'm like, forget it. You're going to see me walk out of five different rooms. So if you want to guess, go for it. You know, I don't, I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Today, like, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to do anything anymore. Like, you know, I got the respect. I've been here for so long that they know me. But at the beginning, it was very intimidating. And I didn't really know. Uh, I was afraid of, like, people starting rumors. But not because that could end my career, you know. I was trying mm -hmm. to start a new career. And that would just be like, oh, this girl is, like, hanging out with all these other guys. And men didn't, didn't need to think about that to interview other fighters. At that time, we didn't have the structure that the UFC has today, you know? So you couldn't have access to them in the lobby. You would talk directly to the fighters and they would just set up where to go. And usually they are in their room. There's no other way, there's nowhere else to go. So it was a very, uh, I remember that I had myself thinking more than once. At the beginning, I was uh, very careful, you know, because I, I had to think about those steps and I had to think about like, wives and other people who were with them all the time to not feel like this could threaten my career. So um, I think it's something that a man probably would not, would not need to think about or do, you mm -hmm. know, but that was my reality. And it also goes, goes back to what Phoenix was saying about the need to be perfect. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. why I was nodding so enthusiastically because I agree for many reasons, there's this idea that you can't mess up. And I think that we're often expected to walk in possible lines. And this is one of them as Lev Evelyn was saying, um, and, and Laura, like you have to behave a certain way. So as not to give a certain impression, uh, which is something that I'm sure uh, a lot of male male interviewers are not even it's not even a thought in their head because it's just they're worried about their questions they're worried about the lighting they're worried about whatever right they're not worried about the tone but we have to strike this balance of having the of being friendly because you need to be friendly to get things you need to have a friendly demeanor like conducting an interview isn't it so much pleasurable to watch and do when it feels friendly when it feels like you know it's a casual conversation rather than a job interview so in order to do that you have to establish a certain type of lightness with with your subject and that is so easily misconstrued i am sure that any of us who have read a, a YouTube comment in any of our videos, which highly advise, I guess, but we Never. all do it. <laughs> Don't ever do it, but you do it at some point of your life. Um, I do it after a glass of wine or two. It's just my, my hurt, uh, self uh, immolation ritual. But anyway, so you go there, you always see somebody accusing you of hitting on the fight. You always see that. Like, I, I don't think I've ever not had that happen in at least one video. So it's like, you have to be friendly because you have to have that sort of interaction. You have to be friendly because you have to make friends. You have to have context. You have to establish a report. Uh, but you can't be too friendly. Otherwise, like Evelyn said, you're, you're worried about people uh, making these assumptions of the rumors. And we all heard the rumor about another woman. We all, we've all heard it. We've all heard somebody say that another woman slapped around to get to where she is. So, and you don't know if you're ever that rumor too, because you probably were. So it's kind of like you have to walk an impossible professional line that, again, this is part of just the small things that hold us back because it's just, it adds up and it can get very discouraging. If you don't have a lot of passion for what you do, if, you know, at some point it stops paying off for you, like you just, and you stop and really think about, oh, okay, so these tiny little bullshit particles have amounted to a tiny, a enormous bullshit pile. Do I want to put up with it? And a lot of people decide that they don't want to put up with it. And I can't blame them. I'm, I'm a masochist. I feel like we all, <laughs> we've run into the same problems. Uh, we talk about MMA. I think we've run into the same problems in other fields too, but yeah. um, you get what I'm saying. But please don't read YouTube comments. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Learn that. Anna, Anna, don't read. <laughs> Yeah, now, I'm, uh, now, now, now that I'm a commentator, I, I'm trying to, it's another world, and I think Laura knows, and Julie, 
like, because before I was just a reporter and I was great. Now that I have my own voice, I suck mm. sometimes, you know? And then they are, and they're crazy. They go like, <laughs> attack my family, my dog, everything they want, you know? So it's kind of a new whole level of uh, psychology that you have to, to, to deal with. Yeah, I remember once when um, Conor McGregor was getting big, he and then he was fighting in, uh, in Boston, and I had like a really good um, report here when he came to Rio with him playing capoeira, so he knew me. And then at the um, uh, open workout at Boston, he would just tease me, like he punched my camera and he did like Conor McGregor things, but because I was a Brazilian one there, you know. And then, so, but was really curious. And then I wrote a piece about how Connor would like tease me to get into Aldo and make the, the, the buzz in here in Brazil. And then there was a comment saying, if Connor is not, it's not fucking Anna, like this, it's, he, if he's not fucking Anna, he's an asshole, yeah. And then this comment was like, liked more than like 200 times. And I was like, what? You know yeah. what I mean? Like. Why people care? Why, why people go there? And it's, I, I think it's mean, you know? It's not long, only like, we're just doing our jobs, right? I had, um, I had a really fascinating thing happen, say, uh, when, when the first article came out about, you know, I think MMA Junkie put out um, on their Instagram, Laura Stanko has aspirations of being, um, and again, all deference to Kathy Long, um, she was absolutely the first, and I know that, but the way that they put it was uh, to be, you know, the first female UFC commentator. What do you guys think? So it was inviting uh, responses, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh God, this is going to be rough. <laughs> um, and, and, and for the most part, I really was pleasantly, I was pleasantly surprised by a few things. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised by the male coaches and a few of my male colleagues who were very, very quick to step up and kind of give me their stamp of approval. It sucks that I need their stamp of approval, but like it meant so, so much to me that some of the guys that I work with were like, no, she knows what the hell she's talking about. This would be great. There were definitely a lot of no, fuck no, that's a terrible idea. And, and I did something that I'm almost ashamed to admit I did. Okay, bear with me. The first one was the first fuck no. I was like, who is this guy? So I messaged him and I said, I said, sir, uh, I just, I'm curious to know. I want you to understand, like, I'm not angry about this. I'm genuinely curious to know why fuck no. <laughs> said fuck no to this idea. I get it. I, I, certain commentators I don't, are not my favorite. You know, I was trying to be very non-confrontational, overly non-confrontational. I did that five or six times, every single one. And I can show you the screenshots. Every single one said, oh, well, to be honest with you, either I, I, I wasn't familiar with your work or I've listened to a baseball game or I listened to a hockey game one time <clears throat> when two women called it and I just, I didn't like it. So that was, and, Every single one of them said, you know what, I went, not every single one, like three of them said, you know what, I went to YouTube and I looked up videos of you talking and I actually am okay with it now. Like, this, this is fine. You can, you can go. So the, the, what fascinated me was this knee jerk, fuck no, no, yeah. never, never reaction. But then when you approach it and, and very go above and beyond and very kindly and very non-confrontationally and privately so that you don't embarrass them, say, I really want to know if it is my voice, I, I want to know it. Like, Cause maybe I can make some changes to that. If it's, if it's the information I put out there, if you think I don't have the credentials, I want to know that. Cause I want to know if it's things I can fix or things I can't fix. Right. And the, it was to a T it was this, this knee jerk reaction of I've heard women call other sports and I didn't care for it. So no. And that's another part of the perfectionist, right? Because whenever a woman steps up to that role, she's terrified that she's going to be that person who people listen to. And then 
cut off, like wrote off all women yes. forever. So yes. you have, you carry that weight with you, right? Like, especially well, when not, it hasn't happened yet. I keep, we keep acting like it's going to happen. It's nowhere close to happening. Okay. But, but it when it happen, happens, yes, it is terrifying when. to think about. When it happens, you're going to have to deal with that. Like we all have to deal with that stuff, right? Like Whenever Anna, we go into like a space. Anna has had to, to deal with for years. I'm sure, Anna, you have, I'm sure you have a million stories because I, there are times where I'm listening to a broadcast where DC or Paul or Dan or whoever will say something that I know is either a simple mistake they made or just blatantly incorrect. It's not an anaconda, it's a dart. I know the difference. I have had to explain the difference to male colleagues before and they all will, they all know this. But if I were to get that wrong on television, I would be murdered. Yep. And that person like I don't think women should do this because Laura made that one mistake once. Therefore, all women, all women <laughs> are not equipped for sports. Period. Yes. Period. Mic drop. It's insane. Uh, and that's a, a part of the invisible pressure, right? At least for me, like whenever I do anything, I'm like, am I caring? Because uh, at least for me, when I get invites for uh, certain things, like I would love to have a female perspective on this. So it's not you. It's the female perspective that you as a woman <laughs> offer. So it's like, I would, so I'm speaking on behalf of, and Anna and Evelyn probably get that with Brazil too, but that's a whole other thing. What does Brazil think of this? <laughs> and like, what do we, <laughs> speaker, it happens a lot. Like we would love to have a woman on board or like a female <laughs> perspective and bless their hearts for even like going that extra mile. Cause I think that, uh, the allyship that <laughs> Dr. Singleton, I'm just going to call you that. Cause doctor is very fancy. Um, uh, it's better than just call you by your name. Uh, but that she was talking about, uh, it's just, it's, 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 it's just crazy. It's part of like, we were talking about just a small, to me, this has been a therapy session talking to you because I feel like we have so many shared experiences <laughs> that, you know, you talk to men about it and they're like, sometimes they're actually very interested. I, I have a lot of, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of men in my life who actually care and want to hear and want to learn, but it's different. It's, oh, really? That happened? Well, of course that happened. It happened to me too. And that's just part of why I think that it's important to have women like Laura being a commentator and having Anna now as a commentator and having us feeling of these roles because it's different for us to be saying no this is a thing that happens this happened to me it's more relatable to a person you know it's more when they see us and see us in our humanity and not as figures I feel like that's when people really start sinking in what Laura does is do that when she's reaching out to these people she's not a face she's a person and it's like oh you're a person so I can Oh, and people have a hard time even constantly like, reconciling those facts. So I think that the more of us are there, the more, uh, the more people see us as people and the more we occupy those spaces, that's when the change happens. It's not a one thing. It's not one person doing one thing. It's just like, that's why we have to fill those spaces because when the spaces aren't filled, like whatever people can't see, it's like we don't exist. We're talking about the higher weight classes, right? Just before. The answer you get is, oh, there aren't women competing in those classes. There aren't women to do that. Um, when you hear about commentators or why aren't there enough women doing this, they're just not as interested. Like, so, you know, like when it's out of sight, it's almost like this doesn't exist. So that's why I preach that we should always be in sight. You know, it's a little tacky, but like representation matters and being seen matters because of this, because, you know, I think a lot of the problem of the world is just dehumanization. And the longer, the more we make ourselves human and visibly human, the better. I, I, I'm so, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say really quick, I'm so glad that you did that, Laura, because <laughs> that makes such a huge fucking difference. It does, because that's when change actually happens. When you check someone, even digitally, because people will have these thug thumbs and they'll say whatever they want from the can. And half the time it's just because they're following along as digital sheep and they want to stand out and be cool and put the funny meme or be the first, which is why I don't even know why people still do that. Like first, why they put that on comment. <laughs> But besides all of that, it's like, that's when, when you check someone and actually force them to do a little bit of critical thinking and it's like, oh, and some research got forbid, it's like, oh shit, wow, yeah, you are actually pretty damn smart. You know what the fuck you're talking about and you are in this and it's, you know, like that, oh wow, okay, I'm sorry. Like that's how in every vertical of politics, uh, business, you know, this obviously, like that's how things get changed because more people aren't willing to do the education or the research because it's lazy. That's why people just read the headlines and then they don't click or read or view. But to go beyond and then actually respond and then call them out individually, and you did it in the perfect manner of like, you <laughs> know, like, oh, well, why? 
I'm sorry, I feel that way. That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion, but yeah. why did you say fuck my life? Like, why, why did you, why? Like, oh, well, I, this day did it first. Everyone was doing it. I thought it was cool. But to challenge them to go a little bit further, and I think that's what more of us need to do and the allies of inclusion need to do is to push people back because once they do that and then, oh, okay, well, that's a step of, of creating some change that can reap the, that we all can reap the benefits of. Julie, do you uh, have? A I was I was going to comment on this, um, but I think that was kind of an incredible way of putting it, especially in in terms of the allyship. One thing that, well, I do feel like this is a therapy session for me as well. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's making me when I think about the things that I've said and I've done in the past, coming up as a fighter in the sport and learning about my role in it or what I was going to be doing or how I could stay attached to MMA and how I could keep my, my passion for it going is, you know, the realization of how much I, how much internalized misogyny I myself had, mm -hmm. how many assumptions I was making about other people. Um, when, you know, you spoke to talking to the, the wives of, of the fighters and, 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 you know, the family members, um, when wives of fighters would come to the gym and be like, Psh, you're not training, get out. The, what, what are you doing here? Are you, like, why are you mm -hmm. looking pretty? Why aren't you doing this? There were a lot of assumptions and a lot of things that I did fucking wrong. Um, and it's actually making me less negative to hear all of you talk and, and really, you know, bring, bring these issues to the, to the forefront and just, you know, I love the idea of confronting them. One thing that occurs to me is how much we seem to and I'm maybe projecting my own thing, we seem to seek permission to do these things. We seem to seek permission to have these roles, um, to, to say the things that we need to say, or, you know, and that's why I, I really do love the idea of confronting people. I don't know that I really formulated any kind of question whatsoever. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, yes, you did. Um, and I also like that, Laura, that you say confronting but do it in this, uh, you know, be cool to be kind in a, in a manner that they can't take offense to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. You have to give people an out. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean yeah, interrupt no. to interrupt you. And not at all. There's, <laughs> I love Zoom because I never know. Uh, so please, everyone, go ahead. And Laura, do you have anything to add? Well, I was just going to say, I think, you know, male, female, whoever, people, people don't, um, you have to give people an out when you confront them, right? Like allow them to um, not feel like you're attacking them, which is, I think what is makes social media and the internet so incredibly difficult to have those conversations, which was why I always choose to do it privately so that they can react however they want to react and, and not feel, you know, embarrassed or attacked by it. But I do think that like, challenging people with kindness um, is is a good it's a good practice uh, to kind of do on the daily and I don't expect to win everybody over you know I don't expect to everybody think is going to think every interview I do is great everything that comes out of my mouth is great I don't think everything that comes out of my mouth is great or every interview I do is great but to um, to to bring people along to the idea with kindness I think is kind of my it's my personal mission <laughs> Can I say, Julie, I love that you brought up how you have an unconscious uh, <laughs> negative w uh, manner. W what did you call it? Um, unconscious bias. Misogyny. Misogyny. Yeah. yeah, my internalized misogyny. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, I think that we don't talk about that more. That, oh. you know, and you guys brought this up that we are pitted, many of you felt pitted against each other um, because there's only one spot for the female. Um, and I'm saying female, Fernanda. I know you. Yes. <laughs> Females. <laughs> Women are allowed to say it. Men can say it. Because they'll say females. A female. You can actually Love see it. the face. They turn into rats automatically. Like females. Like a rodent. Anyway, you can hear it when you read them. <laughs> Julie, do you have anything else? I, I wanted to know if maybe we'll ask. Um, there's a few men in this realm if they wanted to ask a question or other people. Um, and then if you have any things that you want to kind of last us, because I realize we're, we're way over time, but <laughs> hell, I love this. Um, I honestly, I can't, I, 
it's so funny. I love hearing, I just want to mention, I love hearing Laura's uh, approach with positivity um, because I do think I am insanely confrontational to people and I don't give them outs um, on the internet because I'm really angry that they've never given me one as a public figure, which I'm really not necessarily a public figure. Yeah, you are. Um, like my appearance on the Joe Rogan show, I have a whole essay about this, maybe I'll publish it someday, but just the results of that. And also just going on the Joe Rogan show is a pretty controversial thing that I had not thought through um, when it comes to misogyny and what, you know, what I'm, I guess, putting myself in conversation with. And I actually think he's a very nice person. I hate his fans. Um, and that's all I can say on that, and, and, you know, on, on that issue um but yeah no i lost lost my i'm sorry i did not take my adhd meds today so <laughs> turn it over to somebody else well you really i think there's a place there's julie there's a place for confrontation also you know i and i think we can't all play the same we, have, we can't all take the same approach so i actually i love reading through your twitter timeline because quite frankly i'm not brave enough to say some of the things that you say so yeah. while you appreciate me taking the, you know, kind and like, let's work this together approach, I appreciate your fuck you approach sometimes. So thank you for that. <laughs> I think that's a good point because there can be balance, you know, and maybe I'm just a Gemini. So I like the hot and cold of, of those type of things. But yeah, it's, you know, the Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, like there has to be some polite, some positive sometimes, like, and not everyone needs to play, you know, a single role like everyone can what's authentic to them yeah is the yeah. best approach and that's how and once you combine all of those different i think you know mentalities to to try and implement change and, and be a service to the community and the others of, of the, the space like that's when i think you know change can really happen when when it's presented in in, in more than one light you know and in both ways, you're making yourself vulnerable. Uh, I'm more of a Julia type person. If anybody has ever read my Twitter, I'm uh, more of an aggressive uh, type. Uh, I try to be empathetic and kind, but uh, yes, I have a very uh, short fuse. Uh, but I do think that in both approaches, you're kind of like making yourself vulnerable to a different thing, you know, to different things. Either it's more verbal attacks or if you are co connecting to another person in a human level, you're also like exposing yourself in a different way. So I think both are brave and courageous approaches in their own right. Uh, just one thing that I wanted to add when, cause Julie brought up internalized misogyny and like Nancy said, I think this is something that we don't talk about enough. Uh, I can speak for myself because I'm embarrassed by how I went about women, not even 10 years ago, like six years ago. Uh, it was a process. We weren't born aware. We were raised in the same system as everyone. So if we're raised in a sort of like a male-centric sexist system, of course we're gonna absorb some of that. Um, and at first, I being, I, like I said, I had Anna and Evelyn to sort of share in the space, but still it was very common for me to be in a room with a bunch of men. And I looked at that as, oh, look at me. I'm so cool. I'm special. Like, you know, to me, like I, I saw it in such a different light. Like, oh, if this, this is good because I'm going to have more opportunities because I'm a woman. Like I'm going to fill this, you know, it's going to be one spot and I'm going to be able to fill it as a woman. So I had that mentality for a really long time, um, for especially in my early 20s when I was that person saying that feminism is bullshit and, you know, this is an equal society, just work harder. Like, I was that person. People don't believe it when they know me now because I'm such the, I turned such an opposite direction, but I had those same things. I thought the same thing. I made the same assumptions. I look at other women in very unflattering light. Sometimes I thought that they were, you know, using their body or their looks to get certain things. I, we all, I think, I don't, I can't speak for all of us, but I think that maybe we don't talk about it as much as we should, because it is embarrassing. You have to confront a part of yourself that isn't pretty and that you're not comfortable with. Um, especially, you know, you're afraid of certain things, especially when you're speaking out against certain things. Like I, for one, I'm always afraid that my past, I'm not a famous person. It's going to come back to haunt me. Like somebody's going to remember this one thing I said once and be like, oh yeah, such a hypocrite. And no, I'm not a hypocrite. I grew. Uh, I think that's yeah. the least we can do. 
Yeah, no, that's huge because that's part of the human experience. We're not who we were 10, 20, 15 years ago, you know, depending on how old we all are. But it's like, yeah, like that's, that's, that's part of growth. You know, society changes because the people within that society changes. Our goals change. We evolve. I shouldn't be the same person I was as a freshman in undergrad, you know? And so it's like, yeah, but we always will have that depending on, you know, our public perception versus the way we represent ourselves socially. That's when things come back to haunt us because people love fact checking and going back and screenshotting shit from 2011. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you call yourself a feminist if you said fuck that girl? So it's, it's always that battle. And that's something that, you know, I know Nancy and I, you know, try and even working with our students in the classes that we teach about media and psychology and social media and, and how we represent and, and believe the meaning making, the process of how we make meaning with things is so, so intricate. Um, and it's, it can get convoluted and complicated. And that's why people don't want to do that work because it's hard. It's hard to have that awareness of ourselves that, oh, I'm different than I was before. Or I thought this, you know, would be a good policy, but now I see that it actually, you know, may not be as, as positive as, as we initially thought. That's fine. So that type of personal awareness is even hard enough mental homework in and of itself. And I think that's why there's some hesitation for people acknowledging that because it takes balls to be like, I was different then, and, but I'm a different person now. Um, we all have different experiences like that. It just takes, you know, some, some gumption to be able to, 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 to uh, be honest about it. Yeah. Just one thing that I just wanted to point out though, is just like, we were talking about how hard it was in the beginning, you know, and like how we had one spot and we still have one spot for the, for the girl and the team. But, um, I see a lot of things changing. Uh, I've been seeing more and more women coming to cover the sport. Uh, even in Brazil, like we have me and Anna are from the same team. We have another girl right now there. Fernanda was from the team, went to another, uh, you know, outlet. I have, I see Laura and the other girls to ESPN. So I think we are getting more girls and we are trying to share the space. I shared the space with Laura at the Contender Series Brazil. We never saw each other and it was very nice to work with her. I think women are supporting women to be strong, you know, even in this field. And I think we are going to see more and more girls coming. I get a lot of messages from students and girls in journalism who wants to cover the sport. And they are asking about how, like, how can we go and do what you guys do today? And I think more and more girls are getting interested in covering the subject, this subject, because in Brazil before it was just like soccer, you know, now they're seeing MMA as well as, as a career and uh that is a good thing that is happening and it's because all the girls that were working with this before us us and i think i think it's gonna grow even more so it's a good thing it's not only bad things that we have to share <laughs> yeah i guess i just wanted to add um to what julia moore was saying and, and to what you guys are saying about your own self-reflection when i think confronting people i think both strategies are good the Julie strategy and Laura strategy. And there's this line, I, I'm a big nerd from a, a, a song I like a lot, it's a Lauren Hill song. And she goes, and after all my logic and my theory, I add a motherfucker so the ignorant people hear me. And I'm like, <laughs> every once in a while, you you've got to check that. your heart and it depends on the person. And then it goes the same way for me, the way I speak with female reporters who want to get into the game. It's a great conversation, I'm supportive. And then I'll ask, why do you want to cover it? And that answer is very important to me. Do you love the sport? Do you love sports? Do you love the storytelling? Do you find the fighters interesting? If it's like, oh my God, I just want to be around these guys are so hot. I, my, I cut them. <laughs> I'm like, you're the problem. You're part of the problem. <laughs> and I change how I even talk to you. I, I'm not mean, but I'm just like, good luck. That's not a good reason. You know what I mean? Like the, I was doing this because I loved martial arts, not even fighting, martial arts. And you know, th there was no really gigs in martial arts, so I had to get into the fighting realm. Hopefully there'll be gigs in martial arts in general, right? For me. But I think that every once in a while, the approach to how you, just like if you're in a fight, you can't always use your high kick with somebody. Sometimes it's, you're taking them to the ground. It's a different approach to how you communicate with yourself, with other people. And I find that being, having the varied sympathy empathy conversation and also having my motherfuckers will help you know <laughs> if that makes any sense and phoenix uh the thug thumbs 
that we we've we decided now I need to use more often from Tanisha. Dr. <laughs> Singleton. Um, no, Phoenix, thank you. Yes, I, I think that it's a measured approach. Um, I think, but having the approach, right? I think a lot of us just want to do our, be pleasing and do what we're supposed to do. But I think as women, we have to be able to have a voice and be out there, whether it's a measured tone or a fuck you. I'm Professor Kidder. Um, <laughs> last uh, thoughts. I have a few just, um, but anyone want any burning questions? We've done so much. We're almost at two hours. <laughs> um, because what I'm feeling is that, you know, having these conversations is so critical. I think all of us are saying things here that we didn't know the other ones were feeling. And, you know, so that's, yes, we have different perspectives and views, but we also are having things that we were afraid to say or didn't know other people were going through. And I think having these conversations, the awareness, because I think that these, what you were guys saying, sometimes the mechanism um, will pit us together. Will, we will fall to these, you know, biased misogyny that we, we that were, that were unconscious uh, misogyny. And, you know, be brave. Be nice, but keep talking. And I think that you guys all said, like, how supportive are are these women? You know, showing people the ropes, giving them support, advice. Uh, you know, I, I love that my student, I have one student left, Atticus down there. Um, thank you for hanging in. Uh, Atticus, <laughs> hello. You know, um, and you're male, but you're gonna have to speak, you know, be there for that we need to show um, young people and, and the next generations that this is how you go about doing it and bring people into the fold. And I would add to that, we have the tools to do that by amplifying each other's voices. Um, that's what, that's our weapon. That's how we get to fight back against all of this is just, we see something that one of us has said, and I don't know if there's a one of us, but I would say uh, a, a female in media or a non-male person in media, um, saying something important and maybe not even explaining what they have to say ourselves because that's their words, just amplifying each other's voices. Um, that's, a, to me, I think one of the most positive ways we can change things. Mm -hmm. Not that male voices are bad either. <laughs> I love that we have to keep adding this. So it's not like we don't hate men, guys. That's not what we're saying here. Like as a reminder, let's circle back on that. <laughs> but I agree. These are the conversations that are to me are the equivalent of Laura's uh Laura's lighting into people's DMs uh educationally. <laughs> I'm big I'm big on that. I'm big on that. <laughs> because that's that's uh that to me is important, I think, for us and for everybody else to hear it, you know. I think like we've, we've said it all. And I just want to thank you all. Uh, you know, I hope this isn't the last of these, um, you know, with gender, media, combat sports, maybe sometime in person. Um, I think that we're going to do it, but uh, go out there, be strong girls, be nice, or, <laughs> or not. <laughs> or assholes. Yeah, just break that glass ceiling. Girls could be assholes too. <laughs> Final word. That's it. That's great. Well, thank you all. I hope you guys um, be safe. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we will continue this, this conversation again. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.